All right. Let's do this. Let's try and get class over with so I can go home. You guys have a horrible attitude. <laughs> I pride myself out of bed. I appreciate it. Oh, uh, which reminds me, does anyone here have a, a, a secret fascination with Jewish mysticism? Always. <laughs> Are you into mysticism? Because it's not, it's not always the same thing as it turned yeah, out. I, oh, well, if we had a lot of people that were into Jewish mysticism, I was going to cancel class next week. So you could go to a talk. But if you're not into it, then the talk will be, you know. I mean, I know it's hard to believe that maybe something could be more boring than me, but. <laughs> What's the talk? Where is it? It's uh, in the art museum. I want to go. Maybe we should make a field trip. <laughs> oh, I have to go. I, we're going to have a substitute. Oh. Oh. So, so, so <laughs> class could like be optional for those who go to the mysticism thing? Yeah, if you want to go to the mysticism thing, you can, you can miss out on the substitute. But I hear she's a lot of fun. Who is it? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so will we have a quiz next class then? Do you know what the sub? Yeah. I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm leaning toward having just that because I don't want because the thing is we have to get we have to get a quiz on the reading for it and it seems like doubling up on a quiz would suck. Last time we doubled up on a quiz, we didn't do so well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, since she doesn't know who you are, you could probably just take the quiz and leave. I don't. I mean, I'm not going to test her on anything that she teaches. I'm setting her up for a. <laughs> 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 but it's good, so you know who I am. <laughs> All right, do we have any? Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, number one twenty two. What is Desmona preparing her wedding sheets for? Is it like because she thinks she's gonna have sex? Is it because she thinks she's like you're in danger? She knows she's gonna die. In what do you think? I think it could be all of the above. Well, probably not the thinking she's gonna have sex thing. I think it's yeah. either like. She fears danger and like knows something bad's gonna happen, or like she knows she's gonna die. Yeah, I think that uh, that's that's my feelings about it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, why is the horn man a monster? <coughs> Anyone? Um, why is the uh, horned man a monster and a beast? Hey. Yes, but what's a horned man? Yeah, okay. All right, I'm sure we all knew that. Did anybody not know what a cuckold was before this class? Does anyone still not know? All right, good, we learned something. <laughs> yeah? Number seven, what's his evidence that she's a soul whore? Yeah, how does, how does, uh, uh, so th th this is a weird scene, and hopefully we'll get to it a little bit today. So the, the scene is that um, Amelia is vouching for Desdemona, and then uh, um, Othello's like, oh, no, 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 it can't be. And then uh, she leaves, and then he says, well, I, uh, you know, uh, she's a subtle whore. I've seen her pray, and that's his evidence. I, that's his evidence to not trust her judgment. So why is her praying make her a subtle whore? Yeah, but how does he know what she's done? He's assuming. Hmm? He's assuming. Or is that's he? Because remember what Iago, remember remember Iago's one of his uh, one of his apparently self self deceiving motivations for uh, hating Othello was that Othello slept with his wife. Does that mean that? Othello did sleep with her. If he knows that she's a subtle whore and could see her pray and knew she was a hypocrite. I don't know. Maybe. So the answer to the question is I don't know. Yeah. Is that why he said that O O O line? Because then they point out something about Amelia sleeping with Othello? Yeah, so he does the O O O. Does anyone remember when he does the O O O? 
It's like when Amelia is kind of like chewing out Iago. Yeah, bad. it's like right, right when, uh, right when the truth's about to come out. It's a weird play. Yes, sir. Desdemona swears that her will and her eyes, ears, or senses did not betray a fellow. Is that everything? Anyone want to do something with that? <coughs> I need to put my glasses on. I'm an optimist. I just have a whole sea full of supermodels and bikinis. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Anyone want to field that one? Desdemona swears that her will and her eyes, ears, or senses did not betray Othello. Is that everything? Not her heart? Yeah, I guess that's not everything. So she doesn't say your heart. Uh, she doesn't say uh, other things. Not like her genitals? <laughs> <laughs> she does not specify her genitals. <laughs> I don't know. We have a... Uh, we have a whole class on, on, uh, on Desdemona. We'll get to the bottom of her. She's a she's an interesting uh, interesting thing. Yes. Um. Why should Desdemona feel fear? Why does she? Yeah. This is a, so. This is according to her. Yeah. Was it because she she shouldn't go there because she was innocent? She didn't do anything wrong. But he had like a look in his face that made her. Think you're gonna die. Yeah, so I remember Lady Macduff was in a similar situation. In fact, that's probably Lady Macduff is probably alluding to. Yes, ma'am. Um, what do you think Jim and Willis on this issue is? Is it death and adultery? Yes. Yeah. Can I see a hand in the back? Yeah. What and adultery? Uh, death. Yeah. Why does Desdemona refuse to name Othello? <coughs> I'm saying she still loves him. Hmm? That'll work. Anyone want to <coughs> I'm sure this will come up in class. I'll accept I'll accept because she still loves him. I won't accept because he's afraid she's afraid he'll kill her. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's weird. That's that's uh, normally when you strangle someone, they don't mysteriously awaken a few minutes afterwards for some final words, and then. I mean, I, I don't know personally. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> All right. Um, in general, because I'm going to forget, and I didn't do a, uh, I didn't do the same kind of. But in general, we're not doing a real super duper good job on the situation part of the passage identifications. <coughs> and uh, that's the one where you should, like, nobody should ever get that wrong because all you need to do is put something plausible and they'll give you points for it. So even if you have no idea who the speaker is or the situation, make it make sense that I know that you've read the play and then, you know, I can, I can give you that point. And it makes me feel better. If nothing else, we're getting an uncanny sense of what reading questions are going to be on the exam or the quizzes. Do you notice that? What did you say? What? That we're doing a really good job of guessing the uh, of guessing the questions that are going to be on the exam. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like really? <laughs> what am I posting the quizzes instead of the reading questions? <laughs> Okay, so there's the nobody, I myself. Uh, what did Brabantio die from? Iago's last words. Uh, what is a horned man? Why is he a monster? <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, what does Othello suggest he will do with Desdemona after he kills her? Yeah. 
<laughs> or just love her. <laughs> I'll kill you, then I'll, I'll kill her, then I'll love her. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was weird. I guess you, know, you kids are uh, zanier than I am. Uh, according to Amelia, why do women, quote, fail? Yeah, because they're bad husbands. All right. Um, why does Othello think Amelia is a subtle whore? And uh, what is the significance of the Willow song? Marvelous. All right. So I did not finish on uh, Iago, so we've got to go back to this old chestnut. <laughs> some ideas for the solution, but since I have a blank line here, I imagine that I had something in mind when I was writing this. I'm sorry, you'll have to bear with me. As I'm sure that you can't tell. I'm not a, not 100% here. So we're on page 27, and we've just finished seeing Iago appeal to the best and worst in Rodrigo. So, uh, down on line 375 or 374, uh, Iago says, Thus do I ever Thus do I ever make my fool my curse, for I mine own gauge knowledge should profane. If I would time extend with such snipe, but for my sport and profit, I hate the more. And it is thought <clears throat> God abroad that twixt my sheets has done my office. I know not it to be true, but I, for mere suspicion in that kind, will do as if for a surety. He holds me well, the better shall my purpose work on him. Cassio is a proper man. Let me see him now, to get his place, and to plume up my will in double knavery. How? How? Let's see. After some time to abuse a fellow's ears that he is too familiar with his wife, he hath a person and is smooth disposed to be suspected, framed, to make woman false. The more is of a free and open nature that thinks men honest that but seem to be so, and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are. I have it. It is in gender. Hell and night might bring, uh, must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. Thank you. So, uh, sort of uh, rem re reminds us, of course, of, uh, um, of Prince Hal, you know, off to the side. This is my real plan. So we get this, this is my real plan thing from Iago. Um, so it kind of ruins the suspense of the play, right? He's spoon feeding us the plot. Why is it? Why do you think it's in here? I mean, does it help anybody? Did anybody not think that that's what Iago was up to, basically? 
No? I don't know. So, um, why is it here? Does anyone want to field it? I guess. That hazard guess. Get some cheap, uh, cheap participation points on a day I won't remember. <coughs> Well, I have, uh, because I always, when I have questions, I always have answers just in case you guys don't answer. And sometimes even if you do. I said it keeps us oriented to plot and character. But, um, but do we learn anything new? Do we? Well, we, we, uh, we learned the cuckold subplot, or reason number two for hating Othello. And, um, but what happened to reason number one? What was reason number one again? Yeah, so he doesn't mention that. He seems to have forgotten. Is that weird? Yeah. And then uh, um, and then he says, I, I don't know if it, it says, uh, I know not if it be true, if he, had, if he has done my office. He's sure got a, he's, he's like an anti-poet, you know, he's just somebody that can take, take a, um, you know, the beautiful act of love making and just make it look just, you know, raunch. But, um, an anti-poet, I like that. Um, so, um, so, and it, and it does seem weird that for all the reasons uh, we've discussed um, on uh, the day that, that we won't talk about, that uh, he wants to believe that he's been cuckolded because it's, it's weird that somebody who doesn't know if it's true, doesn't really seem to believe it, kind of starts talking himself into it, right? So maybe uh, maybe that's a little bit weird. No. And not at this point. At this point, we're just like, man, you know what, man. <laughs> okay. Why does he want to believe he's a cuckold? It's not that hard. Yeah. I think because it'll give it gives him more just motivation for what he's going to do. Right. Right. Uh, um, and then and then uh, uh, so he's explicitly deploying the confirmation bias that we talked about. In the wrong direction, and and uh, um, and then we know with the uh, right into that. I guess knowing is a strong, a strong way of putting it. That um, the the uh, the same the same neurocircuitry and a lot of the same chemicals in the brain, in males in particular, for uh, aggression and sexual arousal are the same. For uh, for whatever reason. So. Um, He's getting himself aroused and uh, to arouse his anger. All right. Maybe uh, victim's discourse a little bit. Remember victim's discourse. Maybe a little of that too. Yeah, uh, it's 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 a little bit interesting because he really only uses it on himself, but he does. It does seem to be there. So um. And then, like we were saying, like uh, Lady Macbeth, he's trying to work himself up and um, trick his emotions into overriding his true nature, rational will, and what he knows already to be true. So remember, Lady Macbeth knew that she didn't have a case, knew she couldn't do it, but you know, really tries to, tries to ramp herself up so she can overcome that. Maybe it wasn't the shirt, maybe it's this jacket. It's the weird sleeve thing. Okay, so uh, I submit here that what we have here is a, um, a man with a good sound logic that's not that different from a, um, a good fundamentalist Christian. So um, to me, like a, a good fundamentalist Christian really wants us all to be you know, noble, kind, wise, and really would like to usher in the kingdom of God and everybody be on board, right? But um, if not, what, is, what are we willing to settle for? The, uh, to help set off the apocalypse and joyfully watch everyone that disagrees <laughs> burn in our own Hellfire, right? It makes sense. <laughs> it's like I agree. Well, I mean, it does. I mean, it's, uh, but either way, you know, uh, that way, if it turns out, you know, his, his his two things. Either way, it turns out at least he was right, right? So the difference is that Iago is not worried about God per se. He wants to believe in man, or at least the kind of mankind that's at least capable of not being a slave to stupid, irrational, cruel self-serving and easily exploitable passions. But that failing, he wants to be right in doubting it. And then so if he watches man burn once and for all, it'll be that same kind of, uh, that same kind of joy that one would get 
<laughs> watching the apocalypse. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure you might have just answered it, but I was just thinking, if he is just wanting to cause chaos, then why does he even care about justifying it to himself? Why does he care about feeling like, why is he trying to prove himself that what he's doing is right? He just wants to do, if you know, like, why? Why is he even bothering? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question, and it, and it, it throws a, a, I think that that, that point, you know, kind of makes it really hard to say because uh, a lot of people through the ages have just kind of just, you know, Iago is just pure evil. Because most, most common antagonists, from their point of view, they think they're doing the right thing. Yeah, we saw this with Lady Macbeth too, right? I mean, this is, this is, a, um, this is a problem thing with the, these, these evil, villainous Shakespearean characters that they're really not that evil. I mean, they, 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 they have to work themselves up in that direction. Yeah. Well, I mean, Iago is like trying to defend himself, prove himself. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I mean, but but just self justification. So it's not necessarily that he, you know, like thinks that he's a Dudley Do Right, but um, but you know, it's like the uh, it's like the stealing from stealing from the video store logic. You know, it's like they're exploiting me. You know, I can I, I get a, I get a couple of CDs now and then, and you know, like so when you're stealing CDs, you're not like, gee, I'm Dudley Do Right, but still you can self justify your actions, right? Most people in prison, they feel they they would do the same thing. They feel. You know, from their point of view, they didn't do anything wrong. Absolutely. I mean, has anyone here ever done anything wrong with no justification? All the time. With no justification? <laughs> I thought that was a socio. All right, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, what was like the first thing you just mentioned? They also have a discourse to themselves that sort of um, validates their purpose. You know, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're just. This is just. Uh, this is. This is a cute thing that we do. <laughs> we're such adorable little critters. <laughs> Excellent points. You know what? I'll bet I could just. I could just have you guys do a class. And just. Uh, well, <laughs> you could, but you wouldn't. So. Um, but it. But but we did. You did make the point that I had on my next bullet point, so thanks a lot for screwing up my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I'm starting to think now, so, the, so, so if Iago is really just this guy that would love to believe in human rationality, but he's been studying too much behavioral economics and uh, um, witnessed too many biases and heuristics in action, and read too much Freud, you know, like uh, been reading too much Shakespeare, <laughs> and it's just like you know what, man. I just I don't I don't know that that we're really that kind of thing. You know, I don't know that we're that we're able to control our passions with our reason. I think we might just you know be making stuff up as we go along. We might just all just be kind of a bunch of idiots and uh, just kind of a bunch of self-serving you know baboons, as he would put it. And uh, and then and then I mean, you can see. I mean, none of us believe that, but you can see like like how Iago could think that, right? If he'd been reading a lot of Shakespeare plays. You know, he'd been reading a lot of Shakespeare plays. Shakespeare. So I, I just wanna just, just in passing, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, you, know, you know, put my credentials to this or anything. But I think that Iago is kind of a Shakespearean character. And I think that, that you know, like uh, Shakespeare was writing some dark stuff now. And I think this was kind of, uh, uh, I think this was kind of a, a crisis of the artist being played out in Iago. And it's just, you know, like, I can't have faith in you people, so I'm just gonna uh, I'm gonna do this. And uh, I mean, it's a huge triumph because uh, um, Othello, as we'll see, as he starts off, he's just completely unswayable, right? That's what he's known for. He's got all his passion subdued, possibly to the point of impotence, and he's just uh, doesn't get riled up, you know, just very calm. People pour, pull, pour, pull, pull, pull swords on him, and he very calmly is like, whoa. Oh. The Jedi mind tricks. You don't want to pull swords on me. I don't want to pull swords on you. <laughs> yeah. So, do you think he was writing Othello during the time when he was having that like crisis with? This was the. Anne this was a dark it? period. Well, not with uh, with Anne. I mean, I don't know. It's, I don't even know if he was talking to Anne at this oh, point. Okay. I don't know what's 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 going on with that. But um, <clears throat> but you uh, 
I'm sure he had something going on. Although, I mean, he couldn't have had that much free time. He's got to write all these plays, act in them, act in other people's plays. I don't know, actors in here? Is it, is it easy to you know, perform like four different plays at the same time and write another one? <laughs> yeah, it would, it would tax me. <laughs> yeah, I can't even, uh, so anyway. So I'm thinking that uh, I want to alter this a little bit. And then I think it's self-deceit. So, um, so they think that uh, the evolutionary psychology people think that uh, we deceive ourselves because um, it makes us better liars. Because uh, like something that, that, that you know, on all all of God's, all of Darwin's creatures. This is a fun thing I like to do now. Just speak in a creationist discourse, but put Darwin in instead of God. <laughs> so all Darwin's creatures <laughs> made in his image. <laughs> are, uh, <laughs> are trying to deceive one another because that's how, uh, that's how Darwin created the universe. By having animals deceive each other and it starts this arms race <coughs> and you, you've got to... Uh, um, and then, uh, so, so human deception is just, uh, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's, we've been raised to a, um, to a cognitive deception and we can like actually articulate our lies instead of just, uh, like, have you guys seen the, the Mimic Octopus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, What's this that? is, if you haven't seen a Mimic Octopus, you Google it and watch the video. It's this octopus that turns into like everything and just uh, it swims along and then all of a sudden it's a sea snake and then all of a sudden it's a flounder and then all of a sudden it's a stingray and then all of a sudden it's, it's really a it Yeah, like instantly. Yeah, and it looks just like the animal, like a lionfish, a pufferfish, it's just a... Uh, That's crazy. Yeah. Yes. I used to have a pet octopus. Those things are so cool. Yeah, he would, he would, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I hate to anthropomorphize invertebrates, but uh, <laughs> he would—he uh, uh, loved playing, and so uh, um, he, he kind of had it figured out when I'd come home from school, and he'd just be sitting on top of the aquarium, and then go in, and then you know I'd feed him and bat him around, and he you know squirt around and stuff, and then uh, um, and he was nuts. He would—he would—he uh, was so smart. He, he'd squeeze out of the tank, and then I kept a, a, I had a feeder tank with crabs that I fed him, and so he'd crawl along the carpet go up into the crab tank, nail like four crabs, come back, and then go back into his tank. <laughs> How but, did he uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Well, he just, I mean, you, you can't, I mean, he, 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 you, you can't, you can't keep, I mean, it, it takes takes more ingenuity than I have to keep an octopus in a tank, but they're smart enough to know, I guess, <laughs> apparently, to. <laughs> But, um, How did you get that yeah. <laughs> You know, it was, uh, they're actually not that hard to get now, but, um, you know, I was like everyone else in my generation, I wanted to be an oceanographer when I was a kid. <laughs> and uh, um, and I, had a, uh, I had an inn at SeaWorld, and I got one from SeaWorld. <laughs> I kept mine alive longer than SeaWorld kept theirs alive, too. How big was it? His head was about that big. He was like that big, oh. swimming. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was like this huge thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like some huge thing. Just like, <laughs> 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 sitting waiting for you to come home. It's like, yeah, I was playing with the octopus. Yeah, no. <laughs> That would up the Andy. Ollie. Well, that was not a digression. <laughs> no, but the uh, uh, so the point is, there's this. So there's there's deception in nature, obviously, right? You know, like you've seen. Uh, there's there's offensive deception. There's you know, like my favorite offensive deception is the the uh, deep sea fish that's got the little white. And the fish come up, yeah, anglerfish. Uh, um, and then you know, like there's 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 uh, stick stick bugs and stuff. So, um, but so in humans, you know, like we've got that we talked about the uh, um, the evolutionary arms race and deception between the sexes, because we've got the, the the conflicting genetic agendas. And uh, and then so so uh, so what evolutionary psychologists slash biologists thinks going on in humans is that um, we're better liars if we fool ourselves first. Makes sense, right? So um, I actually don't know what that has to do. That was not a bullet point. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so the solution, I think we said, do you remember what the solution was for this? Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, no, it was something else. I mean, that's the solution for everything, but. Stop wine. Yeah, it says stop wine. Stop wine. How about expose, expose himself? Did we say something about that? <laughs> just get over it. Get over it. Or someone can prove his conscious desire wrong. Yeah, wants to be wrong. Okay. But um, if he exposed himself, which is which is part of the NF hypothesis, <laughs> then uh, um, that would be the only way that he could show. Because if he wants to, if he wants to, um, if he wants to burn humanity down and show that, that that we're all just a bunch of baboons, it's not going to do him any good unless he points it out to everyone that he knew it all along, right? Because like what, one thing you're not going to do if you're a good fundamentalist doomsday Christian when the world's ending and the beast is swooping down and, and um, whatever the uh, whatever the I really need to learn this stuff better when the uh, the six six sixes and everything. Come swooping down, you're not going to just be there all humble and just like, hmm. I mean, that's when you're going to hear some serious I told you so action, right? <laughs> so we got to do the I told you so. Is anyone here capable of not saying I told you so when you were right and nobody was listening to you? I'm not. I'm not even. And it's so hard. I mean, I just, I'm sitting there biting my lip and it's just not worth it. I'm just like, <laughs> actually. <laughs> okay. So um, that's enough of Iago for now. I'm sure he'll rear his head again. So do we do we uh, do we like Iago a little bit? Yes. He's got spunk, right? <laughs> Who would you rather have at a party, Othello or Iago? <laughs> 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 Iago might make you show your wife. Yeah, but, but you know what? Like the thing is, if you're not his boss, and I wouldn't be his boss. Like, I would not want him as my TA. <laughs> <laughs> well, neither was Cassio. Right? Or was it? Yeah, Cassio's yeah. his boss. Well, Rodrigo's paying him, so Rodrigo's his boss. And Cassio's the lieutenant, and he's just the, uh, the ancient. Well, Desdemona died because of him, and she wasn't his boss. Yeah, but but Desdemona, you know, I mean, you hate to say she had it coming. <laughs> oh, Daniel. That mic was messed up. I think the mic heard me say that Desdemona had it coming. <laughs> well, that's a tragedy. Everybody gets what they uh, everybody gets what they want. So let's do um, let's do Othello. The old black ram. <laughs> Goats and monkeys. <laughs> I did a, um, I was, I was locked out of uh, Professor White's office, whose office I usually use. And so I was throwing rocks up at the, up at the window. <laughs> <laughs> An old black ram's coming your way, you! <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> I got some looks. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh let's Othello's conscious desire. We'll just do one of this fielding all comers here. Because I don't I don't know. What's what's like what's a conscious desire of Othello? Yeah. Dignity and honor. Dignity. Honor. And then I'm gonna put eh, because you had that look on your face. <laughs> and dignity honor. Desdemona? Desdemona? What about Desdemona? Happy with Desdemona. Okay. Desdemona, comma, happy with. <laughs> All right. He wants to be accepted. Assimilated. One of the great ass words. <laughs> Anything else? All right, let's do some unconsciouses. You know what? After doing this exercise this time, I'm starting to really not be able to tell the difference between conscious and unconscious desire. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good yeah. or bad? I don't know. I mean, what's the, the conscious unconscious thing? You know, like, I don't know. I don't know if that's really the way to think about it. <coughs> Wants to be Cassio? Wants to be Cassio? Okay. Wants 
to be a cuckold. Iago's wife. Does he want does he want to be Iago's couple? Oh, received it from other people? Like he's in charge, so people tell him what he needs to know to make okay. decisions. Yeah. So I'll put it mediated from others. Any other, uh, any other fields? thinking, which means a lot of things, but um, I'll put But not at the beginning. solution to all things. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, as we can see uh, from up here, the relationship with knowledge is what I want to start with because it's really complicated with Othello. So, um, the first question is, the, so the, what's the primary object of, of his knowledge that he wants to know about? in this play? Desdemona. Desdemona. Okay, good, good, good. And uh, not only just Desdemona, like he doesn't need to know any of her hair color. Her sex life. Hmm? Her sex life. Yeah. So I'll say her, um, her desire, her, uh, her fidelity desire, something like that. And then um, what are the stakes of this knowledge? Let's look at some examples. Page 25. He says, my life upon her faith. This is after the father's curse. So um, that says a lot. Then on uh, page 60. Perdition catch my soul, but I do love thee. And when I love thee not, chaos has come again. So uh, the whole stability of the uh, uh, Ordo Alceva is a, is a function of um, her chastity and making sure that her appetite's going in the right direction, right? And then on page 70, <coughs> this is, we'll get back to this, but um, this was the, the great, I'd been happy if the general camp had tasted her sweet body. Um, so, um, yeah, his occupation, right? He says, farewell to tranquil mind, farewell content, farewell plumed troops, plumed troops. It's a plumed troop. I don't know how these people are so articulate when they're mad. I would never have thought to say plumed. <laughs> <laughs> 
big words. Name, Steve, Shrill Trump. Pump, pump. Yeah, so his occupation. So, um, hmm, yeah, okay. So everything, right? So this is uh, all dependent on, is that, is that, I mean, what is that? Is he just, is he just completely delusional? Like, do we think that really, do we think really that like if, um, if really that, that if like everybody found out that he was a cuckold, that he would really lose his job and, um, and there would be no more wars for him to go fight in? I don't think so. I think he's blowing things a little bit out of proportion. So, uh, and then the, this is this is a really important, really important line on sixty-six. I think that I think that it's been on a quiz. Oh, curse of marriage that we call these delicate creatures ours and not their appetite. I'd rather be a toad <laughs> and live in the vapor of a dungeon. Okay. Um. Yeah. So um, actually, let's let's go ahead and read this. Starting at, uh, can I get an, an an Othello starting at 258 or 257 or whatever that is? This fellows of exceeding honesty. Hey. This fellows of exceeding honesty and knows all qualities with a running spirit of human dealings, fighting proof or haggard, though that her Jesses Jesses were my dear heartstrings. I'd whistle her off and let her down the wind to great fortune. After four, I'm black and have not those soft parts. Conversation in the chambers <coughs> had. Old Brian declined it with a veil of years, but that's not much. He's gone. I am abused, and my relief must be below him. Oh, curse of marriage, that we can call these delicate creatures ours and not their appetites. I had rather be a toad and live upon the vapor of a dungeon than keep a corner in the thing I love, further than you. Yet says the slaves to great ones, prerogative are <coughs> the His destiny is like that. Even then, this fourth plague gave it to us, and we do quicken, look where she comes. If she fall, if she be false, heaven mocked itself. I'll not believe. Thank you. So, um, a few important things here. So the first is that, um, so we, we have another one of these great Duncan moments, right? The, um, this fellows of exceeding honesty and knows all qualities with the learned spirit of human dealings. Except for it's not quite because that's just right, right? I mean, say what you want to about Iago, but he is in his way of exceeding honesty, like honest to the point where he can tell the truth and still lie. <laughs> knows all quality, learned spirit of human dealings. I think that's safe to say, right? I mean, he's, he's not often wrong. Um, but uh, he's he's sticking he's sticking Iago into his relationship with knowledge. So he's moving from from ocular proof to uh, uh, it's being mediated by Iago. And uh, um, in this uh, in in French psychoanalysis, they call this the subject supposed to know because uh, uh, when you go to a when some people go to a therapist, they uh, construct this fantasy scenario where the therapist knows how to solve their problems and it's just a matter of trying to get the therapist to tell them. And that's just a, um, so they just assume that somebody out there has it all put together and they just need to extract the knowledge from them. Also hysterics do this. I've dated some hysterics that thought that I knew everything and got really upset when they found out that I didn't. <laughs> um, do they still say hysterics? No? Nuts. <laughs> that's a, it's too bad because it's a good uh, it's a good thing. Um, so uh, so we know this is never a good idea. Then he starts making excuses, right? So um, he's old, he's black, he doesn't have those soft parts that chamberers have. Um, and then he jumps to uh, to she's gone. I am abused, and my re and my relief must be to loathe her. Why does he? Why does he? Why does he jump the gun like that? Why jump to she's gone? And this worst case scenario thinking. Safety net. Safety net. He can't handle not being certain. Okay. So the uh, um, so that's the colostomy principle, right? It's 
like I'm losing my colon, but at least I know I'm, I'm losing my colon. Do you remember the colostomy principle? That is going to be on the final, I promise. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this is to, uh, to manufacture um, negative certainty. As a, and then sure enough, on a 271 plus, he uh, tries to make this, this, his little fantasy into a, an, into a proper high tragedy, right? That it's a plague to great ones. <coughs> Prerogative, are they less than the base? Tis destiny unshunable like death. So, um, so cuckoldry is the destiny of great ones, right? Of, of great tragic heroes, it's gotta be like something wrong. So he tries to write this story of him in this high tragedy. And that's not, I mean, this is a tragedy, right? But it's not that kind of tragedy, right? So, um, and then we remember from learning about from learning about comedy versus tragedy, right? Which is the inevitable? Where does inevitable inevitable stuff happen? Is it in comedy? Is it in tragedy? Yeah, because nothing's inevitable in comedy, right? It's just chance and miracles and, and pies in the face, or miraculous pies in the face. And then and then uh, so he works himself up, and then and then Desdemona walks in, and then what happens? right there. Yeah, the whole fantasy just pops and, and no, it's okay. So he can't, uh, so he can't, can't do stuff. So what is, what does he want from his knowledge? Like, what's he trying to learn? What does he want to know about Desdemona? I think we already said it. Her desires? Yeah. Okay. So, um, and then uh, um, what, would, what would certainty look like? How do you know that? How do you know that about someone? And eh, we'll get to that later. Um, so let's relate this to his conscious desire. Do you remember when we see Othello completely happy? Yeah, let's go. It's on, it's on page 36, as you said, comes back from the ship. We remember this. Can I get an Othello from 181 on? It gives me wonder, great is my content to see you here before me. Oh, my soul's joy. If after every tempest comes such calms, may the wind blow till they have wicked death. And let the laboring bark climb hills of seas, Olympus high, and duck again as low as tells from heaven. <coughs> if it were now to die, toward now to be most happy, for I fear my soul hath her content so absolute that not another comfort like to this succeeds an unknown fate. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to put content. Oh, this doesn't work. So conscious desire is content death. What's content? Why is it like that? Homeostasis. Homeostasis, right? Yeah. And then so so uh, homeostasis, you know, floor. I mean, which which has a uh, which has a more stable homeostatic state? Elizabeth or a rock? Rock. Rock. So the idea is, and this is this is a uh, one of Freud's death drives that he always gets made fun of, that um, because the goal of homeostasis is uh, uh, basically to be a rock. So you want to be, you know, like less than less than alive, so you don't have to deal with uh, possible disruptions. It makes sense, though, right? I mean, we see it right here. He wants to be content, and then just just uh, uh, slash your own throat, then there, die happy. <coughs> makes sense to me, right? <laughs> Oh, we have that. I don't know if you if you if, if, if you're aware of this, but like um, you can have like a really crappy bus ride, and then something great happens right at the end of the bus ride, and then what's your memory? Yeah. So like so so we all we all think this right. So if somebody like lives thirty years in misery, and then has five great years, and then they die, we're happy for them, right? But the opposite, if they've got thirty great years and then five crappy ones, and they die, yeah, that's bad, right? We're 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 a rational bunch. But um, so uh, yeah, so certainty. 
or content, not certainty. So uh, colostomy principle again, uh, content, happy, the only thing left is to die. And Othello is saying is that he is completely satisfied, right? It's like, this is it, I'm satisfied. Which is funny <laughs> because And if it was a comedy, it'd end right here, right? So Shakespeare's comedies. You always know that something like Othello is going to happen in Shakespeare's comedies, but you just, the curtain drops before, well, they didn't have curtains, but the proverbial curtain drops before everything goes to putt, or poo, as I put it here. And then, um, and then Iago has an aside down there that says uh, that he's going to ruin everything, his little devious aside. So, oh, that you are well-tuned now. But uh, before that... How does, uh, how does Desdemona respond to uh, Othello's declaration of complete satisfaction? Can someone read Desdemona's reply? The heavens forbid that then our loves and comforts should increase, even as our days do grow. Okay, thank you. So, um, so we, we, know that, uh, we know that Othello's satisfied. Is Desdemona? No. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, so we picture the bedroom scene analog. Othello, that was absolutely, fantastically, incredibly perfect. How was it for you? Desdemona, we can do better next time. Keep trying. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. So uh, the problem with content, as recognized by Othello, is then there's nowhere to go but down. And uh, we can count on ourselves to screw it up. Thank you, dopamine. Even worse, uh, remember, because dopamine, what does dopamine do? Okay. Makes you happy, but it also uh, how does it how does it how does it work with homeostasis? Yeah, it it, uh, it it compromises. It makes you go and seek novel new things. It gives you joy in screwing up your own homeostasis. This is why this is why stuff is hard. <laughs> I know, that's why, because I know right now everyone's just thinking, man, I just wish I could die right now because this is so much joy in this class. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, that's why we want to die. <laughs> um, but the, the, the problem, I mean, this is, this is a famous problem with love, right, is that um, it involves two people, and it's always the other person's fault when it doesn't go right. So content involving another person, especially when that person is um, not, really, not really satisfied, can... Uh, and they don't make a big deal of her being unsatisfied here, right? So this is just probably one of those little hints. But um, so I'm gonna go back to that original question. So um, the only way, so Othello's got this problem, is that the only way for him to maintain his content is to be certain of Desdemona's satisfaction. So is it possible? I mean, can he know for sure, for certain, that she is satisfied? No. Hmm. Well, he can ask. Goes back to his relationship with knowledge. Realize how much knowledge. Yeah. Exactly. But I mean, but 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 you have to, right? With if somebody else is satisfied or not. I mean, I know I know uh, many many people like to think that they can tell, but um, but I, I think that, that that if you if you think you're one of those people you might want to seriously consider that stance because you might look like an idiot later. So uh, he, why don't you just ask her, does the moon, are you satisfied, man? Or what's the problem with that, even if she says yes? She can lie. Yeah, she can, she can, she can lie, and, and we know that she lies. Um, is, uh, uh, is proof of sexual satisfaction possible? Especially if you're dealing with a female? Is there, proof? <laughs> is there like a like a light bulb? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. You did it, buddy. All, all right. <laughs> wow, did he say that? <laughs> I'm sick, man. I'm all hopped up on that. <laughs> something or other. <laughs> oh, what the hell. <laughs> so, um, so this has been a great mystery of the ages. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what book it was. I think it was like Doris Lessing or something. She's talking about being a, uh, an undergrad at college. You know, like this was in the 30s or 20s or something. And this great eminent biologist was going on this big tour. This little geeky geeky guy. Uh, 
was was lecturing at on the um, women's college circuit, and the title and the, the topic of his lecture was the myth of female orgasm, <laughs> which he based on a, his, his some work he did with swans. <laughs> and so she's just sitting there talking, and she's like looking at her friend, and they're both like looking down, looking at this lecture, <laughs> looking at each other, and having this this little guy explain to them that you know, female orgasm is a myth. But that's uh, so a. <laughs> So it's, a, it's sort of a long, famous, famous problem. And damn, you know what? No. Let's finish the lecture for a change. <laughs> oh, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so, so of course, you know, like the, uh, so the female orgasm is like a big topic in, in neuroscience and, and, and all this stuff, right? Because it's so, it's so, uh, you know, like there's really no, like to this day, there's no reliable indicator. You know, like sometimes there's like bodily responses, sometimes not. Uh, and then they think that they, 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 they hook up the brain scanner, right? So they, they finally have it, right? Everything lights up in the brain. Well, except for, or everything shuts down, or no, or so. It's still, I mean, so as far as, as, far as positive science, you know, male knowledge goes, we still have no proof. There's no way to tell, you know? So it's just, uh, it's a funny thing. But uh, <laughs> what, what can you do? <laughs> so the problem continues. <laughs> There's no little beep, beep, beep light yet. And then so here we have to recall the father's curse as we get back to the lecture. And the fact that Desdemona does dissemble. Do you remember when a couple of examples of when she, when she lies? To her father. To her father. And that's kind of big, right? I mean, she was totally a fake person to her father. Is that cool? But on the other hand, he's sort of... He's sort of that guy. I don't know. I'll forgive her. And then, and then with uh, with Iago and Amelia when she's uh, when she's all flirty and she says, "I'm not really flirty," she assures us. And then she's all flirty. It seemed like she was pretty genuinely flirty. Well, I don't know. Can flirty? Hmm? When she lost the handkerchief. Yeah, yeah. Another good example. Yeah, she's just a pathological liar. Like when does a th or when does Iago lie? Never. When does Desdemona lie? Always. <laughs> so anyway, so we have uh, we have an old defunct, as he calls himself on page twenty four, guy. We have an uh, unsatisfied, super hot girl that's a known liar. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we even need Iago at this point? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then and then and then, so we know that he can't be content without certainty, and we know that certainty is impossible. Well, but but uh, um, but certainty is not impossible. I mean, positive certainty is impossible. But I mean, you can you can find out the other thing, right? Like uh, um, so, in this case, getting away from the uh, question of uh, um, of uh, physiological responses. <laughs> I guess that's the, that's the best way we can put it. Um, well, I mean, I guess he could like he could like kill her and then know that she's not cheating on him. But. Um, but the real problem is trying to figure out how to be certain. So let's go to page 70. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Do we have a new hypothesis? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so the good, the good, uh, um, this will be a fun one to read. The top, I've been happy at the general camp. Right. Just the whole thing. <coughs> I'd been happy at the general camp, pioneers and all, had tasted her sweet body, so I had nothing known. Oh, now, forever farewell the tranquil mind, farewell content, farewell the plumage troops, and the big wars that make ambition virtue. Oh, farewell. Farewell the neighing seed and the, sh and the shrill trump, the spirit stirring drum, the ear, piece, the ear piercing fife, the royal banner, and the quality, and all quality. Pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war. And oh, you mortal en engines, whose rude throats the mortal Job's dread clamors counterfeit, farewell. Othello's occupation is gone. Thank you. So um, now it doesn't sound like he wants certainty, right? He wants the uh, he wants that that uh, Rodrigo that Rodrigo non-knowledge, right? And then if we go a page earlier, and sure enough, we see him working toward that. Toward that, uh, we have on, uh, on 332, 333, I swear it is better to be much amused than but to know a little. So what does that statement say? It's kind of a big thing. 
I'd rather rather the whole world fall apart than yeah. Um, maybe it's like uh, Iago comforting him. It might be of Iago comforting him about being comforted by saying at least you know you know there's people that don't know how much worse off they are. So does that make sense? To yeah. Be much used to, to, to know. Well, he says a lot. Iago says a lot of things. He says that, and then he says that. Um, it's better to not know. It's better to know. Better, I don't know. But yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you. And then, uh, and then, and then he, he, he continues on about his blissful ignorance. What sense had I ever stolen hours of lust? I saw it not, thought it not, harm not me. I slept the next night well, fed well, was free and merry. I found not Cassio's whips on her lips, that he that is robbed, not wanting, but is stolen. Let him not know it, and he's not robbed at all. So this is, this is magical thinking relationship with knowledge now, right? Sort of. Not really. We'll see it way worse when we uh, when we get to Winter's Tale with Leontes. But um, so the idea is that that you weren't robbed. You weren't ontologically robbed if you don't know it, right? So if I uh, if I stole your wallet and you never found out, were you really robbed? The tree falls in the in the thing or whatever. <laughs> yeah. The tree falls in your wallet. Does it happen? <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, and then, and then, so the, the, the passage that we read was, uh, um, I mean, so, I mean, he's really, he's fantasizing about his wife sleeping with everyone behind his back. And then uh, that gets his, the O machine fired up, right? And look, there's a lot of O's in that one. What do we remember about O's? Yeah, so it's a, a signal of aroused desire or a change in desire. Or, yeah. So he's really getting, he's, he's getting cooking thinking about this. Pervert. <laughs> so, and then and then three fifty six plus to to Iago. Somebody read starting with villain and ending with weak weak wrath. Go ahead. Villain, be sure thou prove my love more. Be sure of it, giving me the audio proof, or by the work of my eternal soul, I had seen better. Having born dogs, an answer, my walk right. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, this is great. He keeps wanting to be a toad or a dog and stuff. That's good. <laughs> but, um, so uh, this, this too is odd, because here he commands Iago, on peril of his life, to prove his love a whore. This isn't a, this isn't a request. It's not even a threat. It's a demand. You know, it's just a, uh, it's like prove it or die. So, um, you know, it demands ocular proof. So, um, so this is the problem with certainty regarding other people's satisfaction and fidelity is that you can only be certain that they are not. So he needs, in order for him to have certainty, he needs to actually see Desdemona having sex with someone else. That's the only way that he can have any certainty in this, in this universe regarding this, right? So he's to the point now where he would just, he'll take certainty over anything. You know, colostomy principle, extraordinaire. So, um, so with this little twist, his conscious or unconscious desire is that Desdemona is and can be proven to be a whore. This is starting to remind me of that unmentionable lecture. <laughs> and, um, so let's let's stop it now so I can get your papers back to you. Right.